On today's Let's Talk Climate episode, we'll be talking about successful public health campaigns and how to win on climate. Please join me in welcoming our fantastic guests, John Auerbach, President and CEO of Trust for America's Health. Hi, John. And Delegate Robin Lewis, representing Baltimore City's 46th District in the Maryland House of Delegates. Welcome, Robin. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. To jump in, I really, let's begin with a question about the moment that we're in right now, when the world is watching public health. What do you think has worked well and maybe not so well in public health promotion and prevention messaging around COVID-19? And spoiler alert, I think there are parallels to the climate and health work that we can also talk about. Um, John, why don't you go first? Uh, well, it, it's certainly worth saying that uh, COVID-19 is uh, an unparalleled uh, pandemic uh, for in, in our lifetime. And so, so there's a good, there's reason to have a good deal of humility about it. Um, that said though, I, it's clear that, that while some things have gone, gone well, there also are some real problems in terms of the response. Um, I, I think that oh, what things have gone well have been when uh, the people that are um, making the decisions and responding uh, are well-trained uh, in their fields, know what they're doing. They've been working on emergency preparedness, infection disease for a long time. When they're, they're ready to go, if you've been doing this work, you, you, you're, you're familiar with the right ways to respond. The, the, on the flip side, where I think we've fallen down is when um, there have been decisions that have pushed aside the people who are the experts, the scientists, those who are most familiar with the nature of the problem that we're facing. And instead, um, the, the response has become overly politicized or it has been uh, so unscientific uh, that uh, it hasn't been useful, it's been counterproductive. Uh, I would just give the example of uh, having worked at the Centers for Disease Control, uh, there are hundreds of people at the Centers for Disease Control who for their entire careers have uh, been trained to be able to respond as experts to this kind of pandemic. And yet CDC has really not been in the forefront. It hasn't been in uh, daily um, newscasts. It hasn't been um, uh, uh, as much out front as it should be in terms of developing the policy and the response. And so we've had a very disjointed, uh, uneven response that's uh, sadly led to um, preventable deaths and illnesses. And Robin? Yes, I think, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for that introduction. Thank you, John, for framing that so, um, so politely. I think um, the, the reality, to answer your question, Rebecca, what's been done well uh, in managing COVID through the public health uh, institutions we have in this country um, I think I can say this as an elected official, that the issue has been politicized. We have a public health crisis that's been turned into a political bludgeon. There are games of brinkmanship and um, ego massaging and game playing that ultimately harm our ability to respond to COVID and that have caused people to die. I mean, the reality is uh, the politicization of the COVID response has hurt people, killed people, and undermined the already, you know, struggling public health infrastructure that we've had. Yeah, I and I think responsible uh, people for that. And I think the same could be said of climate solutions, the over politicization of climate science yeah. and climate solutions has really been an obstacle, um, you know, where we shouldn't be in, in this country, we shouldn't be arguing about some of the issues where we end up arguing about across the aisle. Um, but there are signs of hope, uh, even in Equal America's own research, our most recent research report showed that, you know, majorities of people across political lines want parties to work together to climate, for, for climate solutions, just as we're seeing people you know, really want um, to work on solutions for, for COVID-19. Um, and so I appreciate that grounding. Um, and it actually flows really well into our next question, which is about 
um, for, for decades, public health professionals and clinicians have worked on smoking cessation campaigns. Uh, and in climate change work, we hear a lot of comparisons between big oil and big tobacco. Corporate entities that continue to market products that we know are unhealthy and who donate large sums of money to political leaders and campaigns to obtain favorable policy outcomes. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, these comparisons, you know, between big oil and, and big tobacco and your take on, on your advice on winning an issue in the face of powerful opposition. Um, and Robin, uh, why don't we start with you first for this one? Wow, thank you for that question. How do you win on a, what seems like an unwinnable issue? What we're talking about when confronting the climate crisis, we're talking about confronting the very foundations of our economic system. We're talking about dismantling the social, cultural, structures that isolate, perpetuate all sorts of historic harms. Uh, we're talking about white supremacy and, and structural racism. Um, that's a really heavy lift, but the, my hope is that we can do it by working in alliance, by working in coalition, and by being really strategic and relentless. I think it behooves us to understand that there will be battles that will be fought by different generations our generation has one struggle. Those coming behind us have another. Uh, but when it comes to the tobacco crisis, the, the tobacco um, uh, debacle in this country, you know, we did win that fight, but it took about 50 years. And it took the commitment of a lot of people, some toiling in obscurity, uh, others seizing the microphone and standing in front of cameras yelling and and it took policymakers, and it took moms and teachers and a lot of people to get to the point where eventually state by state lawsuits were filed against the tobacco companies to, to retrieve uh, financial remedy for the harms that were caused. It took 50 or more years, really. If you go, if you go all the way back to the European settlement of this country and the domestication of tobacco. We could talk, you know, 300, but um, it's doable. And we can learn a lot from the, the, the way that tobacco was, was uh, controlled in this country. It's a great lesson for climate. Yeah, I, I, would, I would really agree with Robin. Um, um, I was um, uh, a city health commissioner for uh, many years when we were really in the midst of uh, just beginning to do things like ban smoking in restaurants, think, things that now people don't even think about. But we, would, we were su even suggesting that there should be a smoke-free area in restaurants. People thought that was outrageous. And this was when I was in Boston. This was not um, in the tobacco growing states. Um, and so if I, if I thought about some of the lessons that might be applicable, um, yeah, I, think I, I think of three. One is, I think that um, um, lots of different tactics were tried. There, there wasn't like a single uh, approach that, that was successful. There needed to be educational campaigns. Young people needed to be mobilized. Um, there needed to be uh, regulations that tried to restrict uh, smoking or who it could be sold to. There were lawsuits, as Robin was saying. So there were lots and lots of things and it, you needed that. I think you really needed to be fighting on multiple fronts in order to make uh, progress. Um, the, the second thing I think we learned was we needed to build um, strong coalitions of uh, people who, for a variety of reasons, were opposed to smoking. Some people were interested in for health reasons, some were for young people, some for athletics. You know, we just needed to mobilize as many people as possible for. Um, different reasons and, um, and um, make sure that there was a united front that agreed on some, some key consensus issues. And then the final thing I would say, which really builds on what Robin said was, um, it didn't change everywhere at once. There were uh, places where you could do, um, it could be like a laboratory where you could pass a regulation or do something in this community that you couldn't do anywhere else. And, and that, that the successes that, could be observed if you did it in one location, then helped 
others to build on those successes. So then it would go from being a city co um, regulation to a state coalition and now ultimately federal. So that notion of fighting on you know, multiple fronts, getting the victories where you can, um, where the conditions allow for that, and then learning the lessons from those that are trying to expand and expand and expand, I think is, is a third area that I would say um, has some parallels to the, the issues around climate change. So That's I'm here. Response. May yeah. I jump in, Rebecca? Yes, please. Really quickly. Please. I'm lo I'm looking at. I said I wouldn't do this, but I'm looking at the chat box because there's always such interesting stuff happening there. And Margaret uh, has asked us to address the issue of complexity, mm -hmm. the dynamic of systems change, and how uh, uncontrollable moving parts work together to drive you know outcomes in certain directions and. I really appreciate that question. So here's the thing about complexity. We can get bogged down in trying to figure out exactly which levers move exactly what outcomes. I don't think we have time when it comes to climate. Um, I, at this point, and maybe it's like my age or maybe it's my job, if I focus too much on how hard it is to get things done, like I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. So what we have to do is like, uh, going back to what John said about coalitions, everybody take on one task. Everyone focus on pushing one lever. And ultimately, we will get the ship moving, right? Um, we can't be daunted. We can't be overwhelmed. We are human. What we, the society and the structures that we exist in, we created. We can change them. We just have to focus. I, I hope that begins to answer your, your question, Margaret. That's my take on complexity. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really, that's so important. And I, I've been, I'm so, I feel lucky to work in the field of environmental health and work on climate change because it's a field I've always, always been interested in since being exposed to lead, lead in the water in my public high school, uh, you know, lead in the pipes. And um, there are times when I am compelled after Sandy Hook, for example, where I just felt the only thing I can do right now is work on gun control. I can't, that was hor horrific. And of course, in public health, it takes it often takes something horrific to motivate significant change. Um, but I know that my my lever, right, is is climate and health is 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 how the environment affects human health. And it and it does motivate me to get out of bed every day, even though I never leave my house anymore. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it, I, I just, I, that what you just said really resonates with me and, and, and I so appreciate it. Um, and what I also hear you both saying is that this is an endurance sport, uh, that this is something that takes a long time and that it might even be a relay. Um, and so just to, you know, we don't have sports right now either. So just making sports analogies um, uh, in order to, to get that across. But, but I hear that from you both. Um, and I, and I want to follow up with another um, audience question, another listener question, which is from Anne. And it's, how do we do our work? when there is a massive disinformation campaign undermining much of what we say. Um, and John, why don't, why don't you take that one? Well, um, you know, uh, we have to uh, be really expert about um, communications and, and we have to be expert about uh, getting the facts out uh, as well as responding quickly when misinformation occurs. Uh, we have to be pretty nimble about that. And, um, and, um, and I think we have the tools for that. I think we may not always have the resources, but we definitely have the tools to understand how to do sophisticated communication campaigns. Uh, they often need to be tailored to different audiences. Um, and so, so if there is uh, misinformation, I think part of what uh, it's important to know is uh, where is it coming from and who is it targeted for and, and to aim our uh, communication efforts, uh, have our communications efforts informed by understanding that better. Um, but we can't take it for granted. Communication is critical and um, we have to be able to do that through conventional means, through, you know, newspapers, television, but also through social media and through um, uh, the, the um, continually changing ways that people are learning information from each other. And um, and that means um, 
of putting dollars into it and hiring people who are experts to help us figure those things out. I think there's also a place, John, for um, the, the policy role. So now that I'm a policy, I spent my whole life basically being a practitioner of public health and an advocate and activist on various issues. And just three years ago, I became a lawmaker. I still sometimes see things from the point of view of an advocate. Uh, whenever I hear chanting and drums and the sounds of a march or protest, like I instinctively just want to jump out the window and just run out of the House of Delegates and join the protesters. And I did that a lot my first year. I can't really... <laughs> That's not really sustainable, but anyway, um, but what, what, what that gives me, what the, per, the perspective that gives me is I understand getting back to the issue of complexity and moving levers and changing systems. I understand that drive, that impulse to, um, to address urgent needs, urgent conflicts or emergency issues, but I also understand the importance of policy in the background, laws and uh, enforcement and oversight of our laws. Uh, it's going to be one of the things we tried to do in the last couple of years with regard to social media and internet communications in Maryland. We tried to pass legislation that would have required uh, social media platforms like Facebook to do better uh, oversight of, of, the, of the content on their sites to be more stringent about falsehoods and lies and, and provocative posts. We tried to do that at the state level, really not in our realm of authority that we tried. It's really a federal issue and we need federal law. We need, uh, we need people who are not corrupt and venal at the FCC, for example, which we don't have right now. But there's a, a role for changing legislation, changing policy regulations, and then enforcing them. We should always think about every time we're talking about communications, uh, it's happening right now at the federal level where we know there are disinformation campaigns uh, and uh, being, it being waged by hostile foreign powers. We all know who they are. We know that there are also capitalistic uh, profit-making incentives for some companies to use disinformation or to sell their products or whatever goals that they may have. Uh, so we have to be just as aware of the uh, policy tools that are at our disposal. And that means electing the best people to office in every level of government. That is just as important in terms of communicating as everything else that John listed. And maybe I'll mention one other thing. I totally agree with everything Robin said. And I would add that, you know, just one other thing that, that I think we've really learned from communication campaigns um, that are based on, that, are, that have worked in the past that have to do with uh, public health issues is you have, to, you have to lead with the facts. You, really def you definitely want to have them be um, uh, factual and give data that is, is helpful. But there has, you have to also lead with your heart. <clears throat> and there have to be human stories, real stories, real, real people who've been affected that talk about um, what it's meant. Um, because a, a lot of people, some, some people learn by hearing the facts, other people learn by hearing the stories about uh, what this has actually meant in people's lives. And we just, we need to do, we need to do multiple things because people are motivated by different reasons. Yeah, and actually last week on our uh, Let's Talk Climate episode, our Path to Positive Communities program hosted that and had two elected officials on talking about it's those personal stories and the stories of constituents uh, that break through the noise and get to the elected officials. Um, and I think that's so important for the federal level, but also the state and local level. Um, I think people think about DC often, um, but it's it can really uh, make a, there's a little bit, and, and Robin, maybe you can attest to this, it's, there's a lower barrier, uh, you know, to entry when you're trying to just get in, to get in touch with your state or local representative than it is to get uh, in touch, because they represent fewer people than, you know, your state senator, or the, your senator in D.C., for example. Um, That's absolutely right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. The other thing, I hope that advocates on the phone will, will get this message loud and clear. Elected officials want to hear from their own constituents. They want to hear from people who can vote for them or who could potentially vote them out of office. I care about everyone in Maryland. 
But when I come home to my district, it's my constituents of people who elected me that I want to hear from. Theirs are the stories that matter most to me. And I get, I love all Marylanders and I work for all Marylanders. But I click open the emails of my own constituents first. That's just the way it is. <laughs> so don't email me from Utah. Like, don't at me from Alaska. I won't open your email. Um, it's really important. And that just has to do with the, the human, essential human nature of, of this work. You know, um, elected officials are not celebrities. We're not, um, you know, we're not all powerful. We're actually people. And, mm -hmm. and so think about that when you approach us and ask us to do what's right by you. And, and, and I also just want to ask quickly about health professionals speaking up on, on these issues. I think, you know, when there are some more um, well understood public health issues, um, we talked about smoking cessation, I mentioned gun control, you know, these are sort of go to issues where you would seek experts, uh, you know, public health experts to come testify, you know, physicians who might take time out of their, you know, daily practice to come testify. What does it mean to you, I think, to, to both of you when you hear from health professionals on climate solutions? What is that? How does that affect, um, you know, the way you're, you're thinking about climate solutions? And, and why is it so important for, for health professionals to weigh in um, on climate solutions? Um, and uh, John, if you want to go first, uh, go ahead. Uh, well, look, I'm prejudiced because I'm a public health guy. So, you know, I, I always like to hear public health people and I respect uh, health professionals as well. So, so I think that I, I you know, right now is an interesting time because uh, uh, people in public health uh, are perceived as being controversial because they're actually saying some things that um, that have become overly politicized. Um, but in general, I think when public health and healthcare leaders um, speak um, and they talk specifically about um, the uh, information that relates to uh, the way that this affects someone's health, the way that climate change reflect, reflects uh, uh, health, and they can talk in concrete and specific ways, giving evidence of where negative things have happened. Uh, I think that resonates with, uh, with a lot of folks. Um, I, I would share with you that we work with um, state and local health officials across the country, and there are some parts of the country where public health uh, officials understand fully about climate change, but they can't use those words. So instead, they'll talk about weather-related emergencies. And they're, they're actually able to get the job done. So you know, by talking about those things in terms that people can hear, uh, sometimes you can talk. I, I've seen folks talk about weather-related emergencies, um, knowing that if they say the words climate change, that will, people will stop listening. But if they talk about what a weather-related emergency that is contributed to by actions that are being taken by people, that people will hear that. So, so I think part of it is, is um, health and public health people um, also not, not only speaking about what happens in terms of health, but understanding who they're speaking to, understanding how to shift the message to the environment that they operate in so that they can kind of un understand how it will be heard. Uh, I, I like this question and I appreciate what you're saying too, John. I, um, when you ask Rebecca, how do you feel when you hear from public health professionals, from clinical health service delivery professionals? My first thought was I feel confident uh, in what they're saying. I trust them. I heard somewhere that the U.S. military, the, the branches of the six branches of the U.S. military are the most trusted of all American institutions. But I really would challenge that. My first reaction to that was no way. I trust the healthcare professionals of this country, whether they're with the National Institutes of Health or the National Health Service that trains and, and um, provides healthcare in, in remote parts of the, of the country. Uh, I, I trust public health professionals, clinicians, scientists, and health policy experts. Uh, I find that listening to them gives me a sense of confidence. I see them as courageous. Uh, I also wanted to say, and, and so I listen to them, um, but that's because, you know, I, I, you know, my brain 
functions properly. But also I wanted to say that one of the things I love about this role, this policymaking role, is that I get to see advocates from all walks of life and some of the most moving and persuasive advocates I've met have been health professional students, undergraduates, but mostly graduate students. When a group of pharmacy students or medical or nursing students uh, or, or medical assistants uh, students comes to, uh, to Annapolis, comes to the legislature to talk with me, I know that we're gonna be okay. Uh, it's very important that people working in the health space be active and vocal about issues that matter to them and to their patients. And they're mostly coming to talk about issues that relate to the folks they care for. So I just encourage um, folks in the health service delivery uh, and, and, and bioscience space to be politically active. Yeah, I, yeah, I would say, more. you know what, I don't know if this is true with you, Robin, but I would say when, when I was, uh, when I was uh, a city uh, and a state public health official, and we would do, um, we would arrange visits to um, elected officials' offices. Uh, number one, they wanted to see their own constituents, just like you said a minute ago. But number two, if people showed up wearing medical white coats and a stethoscope, they, the, the elected officials just listened to them in a, in a different way than they did uh, for people who were not in the medical field. So, yeah. so I, I, I think you're right that, that there is that sort of level of uh, respect that you're going to be told something that's accurate. Right, and there's nothing wrong with using that, those symbols of, of authority, um, symbols of trust. There's nothing wrong with using, yeah. right. right? So uh, yeah, students come in their white coats, medical and nursing professionals and come in you know, with their credentials. It is really important that you all continue to do that. It means a lot. <laughs> and, and, it's, and nurses are, the, I think, voted time and time again, the most ethical and trusted profession. Um, there you go. Car, car salespeople might be at the bottom, uh, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but, and so we, we've worked at Climate for Health in Eco-America with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments to create a, a collaborative, so the Nursing Collaborative on Climate Change and Health. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. partially motivated, you know, by by that by by knowing that they're um, that th that they're some of the most trusted uh, professionals. So. One of the one of the best, smartest, hardest working, and most effective of the 2018 um, uh, Congress um, congressional representatives is Lauren Underwood mm -hmm. from Illinois. Mm -hmm. She's 33 years old. She's African American, and she's a nurse with an MPH. And she's done more to move uh, health policy at the national level than anyone else in her class. <laughs> uh, I, I think if more people in the nursing field ran for office, this world would be better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, no, and I think nursing shortage, so not too many of you. <laughs> and I also, I also, what I gather from the two of you is that if there's a quote uh, from this from this webcast, it's public health gets the job done. Uh, yes. Is also what I'm what I'm getting from this. Yes. Um, and and I do. I want to talk. I want to spend some time talking about um, you know what COVID nineteen has revealed for many people, but folks in public health have known for a long time, and that's about long standing health disparities, uh, you know, in this country. And we in public health have a framework to understand these disparities, known as the social determinants of health. Um, and understand the the long you know his, the history that has brought us to this moment and seeing these health disparities uh, play out um, on this backdrop of institutional racism uh, and so but talking to folks outside of public health it, social determinants of health is still a little bit jargony people don't it's not which is something, of course, being in public health when I go talk to it, it's I I you know you kind of get out of your bubble and you remember right. Okay, you don't understand what this is. Let me let me help you. Uh, let's talk about it. Um, and so I was hoping that that you could give, um, you know, a, a brief brief intro on the topic of social determinants of health. How would you define it? And how can we use the social determinants of health to inform equitable climate solutions? Um, and uh, Robin, why don't why don't you start start here? So that's a fantastic question. For the last two years, three years. All of my years in public office, I've introduced legislation that aimed to 
center social determinants and health equity in state policy. I worked with uh, Senator Shirley Nathan Pulliam, who has been a champion for integrating social determinants of health into policymaking for her, her whole career. Again, another nurse, another nurse, nursing professional in public office. She's retired. I learned a lot from her. Um, we really struggled to explain, educate, persuade other legislators to embrace the, the concept of social determinants. So it's not a given. You're absolutely right. Um, a big part of the job of advocates is educating elected officials. So just know that will always be true. When it comes to social determinants, here's how to think of it. Here's how to think of them. Uh, a social determinant is like a badge in Girl Scouts and you wear it, but it's invisible. It, a social determinant is something that tells the world uh, or, or that positions you in the world so that you are treated differently, that your outcomes are different, and it's not necessarily something that's visible. It might be coded in your DNA. That's how finely grained a social determinant can, can work, or that mechanism, it could be genetic. So um, I think when it comes to you know, your question, how to use social determinants to change minds, to shift policy, I think it gets back to stories. I think the human context is really the most important. I think discussions about theory and, and biological mechanisms belong in classrooms and in the worlds where we're operating in which life-changing decisions are made resources are allocated, stories are the way to go. Talk about uh, a constituent uh, who, a child, for example, who was exposed to no fault of their own to lead paint chips, and that exposure undermined their neurological development and their ability to live their full potential, um, put them at risk of all sorts of negative outcomes. That's a story about social determinants that doesn't use the term. So that's what, that's how I would put it. I hope that helps. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I think that's a great answer, Robin. And, but, you know, I would say that right now people in public health talk about social determinants all the time, but it's a relatively new phrase in public health, like the last 10 years or so. And, and we have a long way to go in terms of actually doing something about um, the social determinants um, for, for the reasons that, that Robin was saying. But so I'll just tell you a story. When I was a city health commissioner, this is 20 years ago, I would do what a lot of public health people do. I would go to community meetings a lot and I would present data about diseases. And I would say, here's the data on HIV and here's the data on diabetes, here's the data on asthma. And I'd say, you know, what, what have I missed? What do you think? Do you have questions about this? And at one of the earliest meetings I went to, someone got to the microphone and said, um, you forgot to uh, talk about uh, housing. Housing is a problem. So this is 20 years ago, and I said, oh, thank you. I absolutely know housing is a problem, but I'm actually here to talk about health. And so that's why I was focused on illnesses and diseases. And the person at the microphone said, no, you actually have to understand that I'm at risk for my asthma because I'm in an apartment right now where there's mold and mildew. And unless that gets addressed, I can't address the issue you're talking about. And one after the other speakers would talk about that. They, one person talked about, I have no heat in my apartment. It's the winter. How am I supposed to stay healthy if I'm in um, a subpar housing? But, you know, the, the, so, so I would say over the years I learned, and I think a lot of public health people learned, that you can't deal with, you, you can't wait till somebody's sick and then say, we're going to try to, um, you know, make you better. Uh, that That's... Uh, that's more of the role of healthcare. What public health people need to do is figure out why are people getting sick and just change the environment so that they're less likely to do that. But public health isn't funded that way. There's, there's no line items that people get that say work on social determinants. The money public health folks get is still um, disease specific. And it's against the law to actually take money from one thing that might say this is for diabetes work or this is for... Um, uh, an infectious disease um, and use it for something else. So one of the big challenges I think we face is if 
if social determinants of health are really key, we need to have resources at the local, state, and federal level that allow us to work on those social determinants, to allow us to get housing and transportation and education, economic development, and engage with them in a meaningful way to figure out how to change the conditions. And that really takes policy change at those levels to have the resources available so that people can move beyond a sort of narrow, I'm only working on a single diagnosis approach. I think that's so important, John, what you said. Um, you've, you've got to break the silos between the various, uh, you know, what's the word, I'm sorry, I'm looking for departments or, <laughs> or you know, institutions. I wonder if any of you guys can remember back to the ancient era of 2009 when, you know, the world was a different place, the birds sang and the sun shone and um, everyone had hope. Um, in 2009, when President Obama took office, one of the first big policy decisions he made was to do just what you said, John, break the silos between the key institutions between housing, public health, and transportation. Anybody here remember the Healthy Communities Initiative under the Obama administration in the first term? He forced the Secretary of Transportation, who was a Republican, by the way, he appointed Ray LaHood, um, the director of the Centers for Disease Control, an African-American woman, Lisa, I can't remember her last name right now, she was awesome and the um, secretary, CDC, and Housing and Human Development uh, secretary, who I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head, but forced them to work together and said, you want to solve health problems? You want to improve transportation? You want to resolve issues of our, the, uh, you know, housing shortage and unhealthy housing? Then you need to work together because these things are connected. One of the first things um, that the Republicans defunded in when they took over the um, Congress was the Healthy Communities Initiative. And so it, it flourished for a couple of years and then began to, to fall apart. But in the couple of years that it was functioning, that it was being supported, um, some important changes got to be made. Thought process for a lot of people, a lot of policymakers and advocates began to change. They began to see more clearly the connection between healthy housing and health outcomes, or between access to transportation and health outcomes. If you're a healthcare worker and you can't get to the clinic where you serve people, their health is undermined. If you are a sick person and you can't reach the nearest COVID testing center because you don't own a car and transit in your area is inadequate, your health is affected. So uh, I think we can look back to the model that President Obama forged and try to recreate it at local state, uh, as local state levels, as well as fight and press to have it restored at the federal level as well. And I would challenge us, and I would challenge health professionals to, when we're talking about healthy housing, when we're talking about you know the ways these are going to connect it back to climate each time, because when we model the behavior of talking about climate and how it impacts our health, I think it will inspire others. Because as you've said, health professionals are trusted leaders, and we can't talk about, you know, when we talk about healthy housing, if there's a flood, which is happening more frequently and more severely, and you don't understand that if there's a flood and you don't get your house remediated appropriately, you could have a mold problem, mm -hmm. right. which can, you know, an indoor air quality is, is, you know, a critical factor in, you know, exacerbating asthma cases, um, in pregnancy outcomes. You know, it's so important to not just break down the silos in public health as a discipline, but can help connect those, those exact issues, everything you just talked about, to climate solutions and the co-benefits for our health and our planet, which then have you know, cascading and multitude benefits you know, when we have these explicit actions that we help, we help people connect the dots. Right. Um, I need to correct something I said. I referred to the CDC in the health, Healthy Communities Initiative. It wasn't, it was the EPA. It was USDOT, EPA, and um, Health uh, HUD, sorry. But yes, you're right, Rebecca, thank you. So, so if, if I could just make one, one additional comment too. 
you know, I, I think when we talk about uh, the social determinants and we talk about working in other sectors, it's also really important that we're, uh, we have as much evidence as we can that changing a policy in another sector has an impact on health because people don't always see that. And so gathering the information and, um, and documenting, it's very important. And over the last several years, there have been some good attempts to do that, which uh, I'll mention just in case um, the participants today are, are interested. Uh, at CDC, there's a program that um, was call is called a High Five or Health Impact in Five Years or Less. And it was intended to look at policy change that could be made at the state or the local level where there had been solid research that demonstrated if you make this policy change, health will improve in five years or less and there'll be a positive impact on cost. And, um, and the, the effort was to look at all the different studies that existed and then find the ones that showed uh, a policy change made a difference. And what they found was, uh, what we found, I was at CDC at that time, was that uh, a number of the policy changes weren't in the health field. They were things like retrofitting the public transportation system so that they were less polluting, was documented to have within five years or less an improvement in terms of health and a reduction in terms of healthcare cost. It looked at uh, expanding public transportation was documented to make a difference in terms of improving health. Um, so there were, there were uh, it, it also were things like income, earned income tax credits. Mm -hmm. um, at the Trust for America's Health, where I am now, we also did another uh, compilation of those kinds of approaches that's called a Promoting Health and Cost Control in States or FACTS. And that too, um, just compiled the data, said, here's a policy. If you want to try to sell this to your policymakers or the public, Here's the evidence it works. You don't have to try to convince them this might work. There's some solid evidence. And so I'd encourage folks to just become familiar with the evidence that's been put together because it helps in terms of breaking down those silos as we talked before, when you can show this isn't just like a good idea. There's solid uh, evidence that you can really make a difference if you uh, adopt these policies. And there's a question that's come in um, for those of us out talking in communities. Uh, this is from Linda, for, for, for those of us out talking in communities about the climate crisis, how would you suggest responding to those facing uh, food insecurity, gun violence, energy poverty, when they feel they cannot pay attention to climate, even when action now is what's required to avert catastrophe? Mm, that's a great question. And that also, I think, links back to another question that was asked earlier about community health, about population um, health. So I'll give you an example from the bike advocacy world. So I um, am very much of the mind that our dependence on the automobile, the combustion engine, is one of the most destructive forces in human society, uh, and not to mention all the environmental impacts. Uh, and so I've been an advocate for mass transit and bikes and walking for a long time. One of the things I've noticed about bike advocates, however, as justified and well-meaning as their arguments, if you lead on the issue of biking, people stop listening because they don't see uh, immediately or naturally necessarily see the connection between having other forms of mobility that aren't cars and health outcomes or economic outcomes or safety outcomes. So the way to address that uh, difficulty is not to lead with bikes, but to lead with health always. I think the best arguments for climate, for addressing climate, working for climate resiliency, the best arguments are grounded in health. There's a long-standing uh, stereotype about African Americans, Latinos, uh, and people of color in general that we don't care about polar bears or that we don't care about the environment. And that is so false and it is so misleading and it's so destructive. First, because it's a lie. Um, I saw the results recently 
I think earlier this year of another, yet another survey that showed that African Americans and Latinos actually care more about the environment than white Americans do. Uh, so it's, it's false on its face, but it also undermines the opportunity for connecting around the issue of environment. It forecloses the possibility of coalition. Uh, so start with the understanding that everyone does care about the environment. No one wants the ice caps to melt. No one wants the ice caps on fire or the Amazon burned to the ground. Everyone wants their children to be healthy. So if you want to talk about climate, begin with the health argument. That's, I think, and speaking as a public health professional, someone who's worked her whole life in, in, in health care, um, I think it's the most persuasive. And also being a person of color, I'm just here to tell you, uh, talk to me about things that are on my heart every day. And what I care about is the health and well-being of other people, particularly vulnerable people, people of color, uh, women. Talk to me about health. Yeah, and you know, I'd, I'd also, I, I think that's absolutely so insightful, Robin, thank you. And, but, but I, I, think, I, I think that there, now we've got a lot of examples of where uh, a weather-related emergency ends up um, becoming the most important thing in people's lives. It, you, you know, and you, it, yes, it may not be happening every day, but if we don't pay attention to it, when we have a weather-related emergency, that, then everything else, you know, housing goes, you know, people lose their houses, their, you know, schools are closed, just, you know, terrible things happen. In, in, in 2019 was the year of the flood. We saw floods in more communities than that had ever been seen before. And those were devastating floods that disrupted communities in completely. And, and so, it, you know, if people think of uh, weather-related emergencies as being about um, the, um, you know, the, the global ice caps, then that, that's too far away. It, it, you know, I, I think what we've seen is lots of things that do direct you right and affect you right now. There's the flooding, there's superstorms, there's hurricanes, there's wildfires. When, when it comes to a lot of infectious disease, we're seeing um, mosquito-borne illnesses expand because they're more and more, as the climate gets warmer, they're more, mosquitoes move north in the United States. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the risk associated with those illnesses increases. Um, heat waves are a major issue in Washington now, it's like almost 100 degrees every day. Uh, and, and you know, when those things happen, they, they really, um, uh, ev everything else is second to that. And, but, but it doesn't happen every day. And part of what we have to do is make those connections. Just like Robin was saying, we have to explain. It may not look to you like that's a weather-related emergency, but that's, that thing that is affecting your health is a weather is related to changes in the weather. And that's a great observation also, John, because what you just talked about is, um, or you alluded to really, is the reality that weather-related emergencies have a disparate impact which gets us back to social determinants of health, which we're all very comfortable talking about. <laughs> but it gets us back to the issue of how to make the connection between your argument and the person that you want to persuade or motivate. And I think um, by reminding or highlighting, by highlighting the fact that floods are more likely to impact poor communities, black and brown communities, um, some of you may be old enough to remember 2005 when there was a terrible hurricane in the Gulf that flattened New Orleans. <laughs> and we all saw what social determinants look like. We saw black communities in, in, communities in New Orleans displaced by floods. We all saw the footage, uh, those of us who remember, saw the footage of African Americans standing on rooftops with babies in their arms begging to be rescued. Um, so I think your, your example is a good one, John, and we can bring it home, bring it home like that, and we can show that climate disasters affect the most vulnerable, vulnerable people first. And those first line, those front line um, folks are the very ones um, who can be, who are already motivated and can be activated to seize, seize control of their destiny. 
another great example about that is the, um, the pipeline in, in North Dakota uh, where uh, Native Americans have stood firm and fought in the face of all kinds of, all kinds of insults and, and attacks, um, all sorts of nefarious harms. Uh, they stood fast to stop that pipeline from being built. It was not, I mean, of course, there are allies of all sorts from all over the world who stood with them. But uh, let's remember who won that battle and take courage from their example. Yeah, and it's not only the communities you're talking about that get hit first and worst, it's also the fact that they haven't contributed as much to the issue. Um, and so the, that, that uh, the harms are unequitably distributed. Um, and, and, and until folks causing the most damage actually are experiencing harm, you know, like we've talked about in public health, uh, it takes a, something bad to happen. You know, it, these, these, the benefits are not distributed equally and the harms are certainly not distributed equally. And we need to think about that as we address these issues in policy. Um, I'm gonna, I have one, I have a penultimate question. And then as we approach the top of the hour, I have a um, one final question for you. So uh, we're gonna turn to the audience once more before we wrap us up. Um, so this is from Sean. I have some concerns about, and this is a really important and a, and a weighty question. So, but I'm going to encourage you to for speed answers because uh, we're we're <laughs> close to our time. So, I have some concerns about sending my son to school with COVID, but his health might be better guaranteed by more exercise, healthier nutrition, and more sleep. Is there an opportunity with COVID to realign our personal and policy decisions? to improve our health and environment. How? So are we, are we pressing the reset button right now? And do we have an opportunity to you know, work on these policies that have co-benefits? Um, and I'll, I'll invite you to, to, it's a big question and we probably could have spent the whole hour talking about this. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts? Wow. John, do you want to take that one? I mean, um, I, I will just very briefly, I, I hope there is an opportunity for that. I, I, I think people are having discussions that they haven't uh, had before. Um, you know, like, you know, what, what should the workplaces be like? What should school be like? What are the different considerations? So I hope they're having those. I, I think um, um, the, the, there's certainly some of those discussions going on with policymakers. Uh, will it be easy to make significant changes? I think uh, I think it's not going to be easy, uh, but I think raising the issues now is a good time to raise those issues and try to come up with new norms. So uh, I say work with your schools, work with your community leaders and, and, uh, and, and come up with creative solutions. And, and I think at least in some communities, we're going to see that happen. Yeah, um, I would also encourage the person who asked that question to get involved maybe run for office. <laughs> but the, my answer is yes. Do we have an opportunity to realign our priorities and remake our society? Absolutely. Um, there's that old saying that the, in, in Chinese writing, the word for, uh, what is it? The word for opportunity is crisis. And what is it? You guys know that thing. The character, it's got crisis and opportunity together. Um, and I studied Mandarin, so I should remember that. But anyway, <laughs> do we have the opportunity? Absolutely. I would uh, suggest we think back to other significant public benefits like Medicaid. The fight to create a national public insurance system was monumental. It took the civil rights movement and assassinations of our great leaders like Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Um, it took a youth movement. It took all kinds of forces and changes to create a national public in insurance system in this country, which is like unbelievable. And a lot of people, folks on the right wing, uh, claimed that the creation of Medicaid would destroy our economy and turn us into a nation of layabouts or whatever it was they said. The same lies they always tell about everything. But here we are 55 years later, Medicaid is a signature um, feature of our national safety net. 
the idea of undermining canceling Medicaid would bring people out of their houses with pitchforks and torches. It is a benefit seen as uh, useful and meaningful for so many people, you can't take it away. And so I suggest that some of the changes we're making now, for example, slowing down traffic in, in uh, many streets, there's a global initiative called Slow Streets or Open Streets to stop cars from driving so quickly and mowing people down without consequence. Um, some of those slow streets that are being created will never become thoroughfares again. They will be reclaimed, like nature reclaiming uh, um, in a, after a disaster. They will never go back. People will never tolerate it. Once they've had a benefit, they will not tolerate it being removed. I hope that we see an expansion of childcare because one of the great obstacles to getting our um, economy back to health or, or to health, it's never been healthy, but to make it healthy would be universal childcare. And everybody knows it. And we can't, we can't go on like this. So to the extent that even small incremental changes like the creation of a slow street or open dining or um, uh, funds for uh, gig workers to get unemployment. Can you guys imagine us trying to take that benefit away now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what gives me hope. And, and so, I think yes, for me too, what gives me hope is reckoning with the global pandemic on top of our national reckoning on race and that it is that we are struggling to find the path forward that builds public health infrastructure while incorporating, while breaking down systemic racism. That's what, that, that these things are happening simultaneously can be incredibly anxiety indu inducing and provides the greatest opportunity for, for leaps forward. And, um, and, and also, as a result of that, we actually have an opportunity to normalize uh, discussions around mental health uh, because everyone is anxious. Uh, and, and I think, you know, climate change also layered on top of that too. I mean, people suffer eco-anxiety and suffer tr trauma from losing their sense of place. Um, so one last question to wrap us up, and this is a lightning round question because um, we are moments away from, from closing out, but um, successes of public health are often invisible. When we're successful, it means we have prevented something from happening. Uh, and I want to ask your advice on how we make successes on health and climate more visible, but in a lightning round fashion. <laughs> oh, John. Well, we claim them. I mean, we have to, we have to be visible and vocal about those. And um, they may be invisible when they occur, but usually what happens is lives have been saved and you can often show you know, this is what happened before, and now here's the drop in terms of illnesses, injuries, or deaths. So we need to be bold, and we need to be out front and not shy or modest. We need to claim them, and we need to educate the public and policymakers that uh, they're real. I think that's a perfect answer, and I can only echo it. And I would also circle us back to your earlier comment, John, about the importance of more sophisticated communications campaigns. Scientists, healthcare folks, we are terrible at messaging. Mm -hmm. First, we don't get how to do acronyms and we make up the worst slogans. So we need to get better. We need to hire good people to do that for us. But if we claim our victories, like you said, John, and like and if we and if we are more sophisticated and more assertive and relentless about celebrating them, mm -hmm. uh, we can't lose. Well, just thank you so much, John and Robin, for joining us as our guests today. We are grateful for the words that you shared and the work that you do. We're at the end of our time today. We are here today, but I know you have gotten the wheels turning for our listeners uh, about what we can all continue to do to raise climate solutions as a public health priority. Please stay in touch with us and let us know what else we might be able to do to support and amplify climate action and solutions. Join us again next week on Thursday, July 30th for the next episode of Let's Talk Climate, the fierce urgency of now, advocating for climate solutions, when our Blessed Tomorrow director will be in discussion with Reverend Gerald Durley, board chair for Interfaith Power and Light, and Rabbi Jenny Rosen, founder and CEO at Dayenu, and Reverend Brooks Burnt, Minister of Environmental Justice at the United Church of Christ. 
Engage with us online using the hashtag Let's Talk Climate. And be sure to subscribe and follow us for the latest thought leadership, resources, and episodes on climate action and advocacy. From all of us at Eco America and Climate for Health, thank you. Please join me in caring for our climate in order to care for our health. Stay well, stay safe, get active, and see you next week. Mm -hmm.